Hey folks, greetings and welcome along to the New Zealand Tech Podcast. We're at episode 479. My guest in the studio today, Savannah Peterson, all the way Hello. from San Francisco, but back in New Zealand again. Very nice to have you here. Such a pleasure to be here. You know this is my favourite country on earth and quite possibly my favourite podcast on earth. So oh, thank you that, for having me coming. back. Yeah. <laughs> Greg, it's please so set nice up to the be invite here. for the next. <laughs> Excellent. Hey, great great to hang out. It's always fascinating talking to you. You bring some you know, unique perspectives to the show. You've got insights you. that... Uh, few others have I think it's you know it's it's fair to say your uh, locality there in uh, San Francisco and the and the Bay Area um, mm -hmm. means you, you you see things some of us might not uh, might not see we're, we're a little bit of ground zero for for both the tech benefit and the tech drama depending yeah, on the yeah, situation it's true <laughs> I think we're talking about true. both today too so it's we, very we appropriate are, yeah um, so we're going to talk about you know a little bit from a um, New Zealand perspective of, of things going on. There's some you know, local announcements and and happenings and some quite big uh, international um, topics, I think, that we'd, we'd like to uh, uh, delve into. Mm -hmm. um, artificial intelligence, COVID-19 is sort of back on the agenda. Um, there's a crazy story to do with Google and Uber, uh, another one to do with Airbnb, um, people being tracked and then, um, you know, considered as crime suspects because of uh, the device they were carrying, even though, you know, no involvement at all. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's some fascinating stuff. Um, but before we jump into those topics, a huge thank you uh, to the brands that are standing behind the technology sector in New Zealand and make this show possible. So big thank you to Sumo Logic, Vodafone New Zealand, Spark New Zealand, Vocus, HP and Samsung. Thank you. That's what makes the show possible and allows us to keep developing, uh, allows us to do the video streaming that we've been uh, we've been developing as well. Uh, and I know most of you will probably just be, you know, listening in while you're commuting, exercising, um, doing the dishes, whatever it happens to be. Um, so thank you for listening in. Uh, but if you would like to catch the live streams, uh, most often around 4 p.m. on a Tuesday afternoon, you can be the very first to catch the show. Uh, we're streaming now on uh, Periscope, on Facebook and on YouTube. So look out for NZ Tech Podcast and follow us and like us and subscribe if you're interested in catching a bit of that live video. All right, so let's jump in, Savannah. Um, now, usually at the beginning of the show, we ask guests, where do you fit into this big wide world of tech? How would you, how would you explain that for yourself? So I make the future less scary by building community and reputation around new products and technology. And what that literally means is I get to travel around the world talking about new tech, how it applies to our future lives and our present everyday actions and developments. And my favorite thing that I get to do is act as a bit as a global ambassador for the New Zealand technology scene and spread the good word of all the fabulous things that you do here and in a very fervent attempt to be the antidote to tall poppy syndrome. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's awesome. Well, let's jump in. Now, first up, uh, Tesla have of officially started uh, offering an upgrade to the infotainment system in their, I'll call it older vehicles. I mean, they don't have too many, uh, too many vehicles. There's you know, older. Th three. What does that really mean here? <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, the, I absolutely love the story, and you know, I know listeners might think I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit biased on uh, on Tesla having. Um, you yeah, know, what are you driving these days? Having um, you know purchased one, but. Look, with the, the different uh, interactions that I've had with the auto industry, the, the thing that frustrated me, or I don't know, yeah, that's probably a fair, fair description, my interactions with the traditional car manufacturers has been their slowness to move to the sort of model that we have with our smartphones, whereby... You know there are these ongoing software updates and capabilities. Now, 
Tesla positioned themselves in a in a nice way whereby you get these ongoing software updates. And no, you don't have to take your vehicle back to the service center. And, it's something that differentiates you know, them already, I think. It does. Um, but then uh, you've got this aspect of, well, I got the Tesla you know, two years ago, three years ago, and they've upgraded to a new infotainment system. They've upgraded to a you know new self-drive computer. Um, will I be stuck with this old tech? And as far as I can tell, with pretty much every other auto manufacturer on the planet, if you bought the 2020 whatever, and next year some better chip, some other bits and pieces come out, too bad buy a new one buy an, you have to buy another car to get that capability which is crazy when you think about it really well in the in the world we're in yeah. and when you when you think about the size of that investment and yeah. really look you know they're changing a small thing now okay we get it with phones and they have you know we've we've talked on the show before about you know there's there's a, you know, a couple of manufacturers that have sort of built these you know modular type phones and other gadgets Realistically, that hasn't really it hasn't, hasn't really yet. caught on. It hasn't it's, stuck. it's complicated, and you're yeah. dealing with a much smaller investment. But you know, anyone who's a gamer and has got a custom machine knows that if there's a new graphics card or a new something else, you can drop that in and you know and upgrade it. Well, you know, I just I just think that it, it's worth yeah. This is worth talking about. So um, what they're doing the infotainment upgrade. Uh, two and a half thousand uh, US dollars, and yeah, what that allows you to get is is really the the latest and greatest uh, into uh, a Tesla Model S or a or a Tesla uh, Model X, and um, you know away away you away you go. Now also, so that's one part. That's the infotainment um, part. But if you um, also have uh, a Tesla, and you've paid for the full self-driving capability, and I and I know that name. We can laugh at it because there isn't a full self-driving capability as such just yet. Um, we're real close, though. I think. <laughs> we're on that journey. <laughs> yeah, and there's been you know multiple versions of um, of that hardware. Um, those people that have paid for that are getting um, are getting upgraded, which is. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It's, I'm not going to delve into all the ins and outs of, you know, what you what you can and can't get, and you know there'd be a few things to consider. But I think anybody that bought a vehicle, yeah, let's say two or three years ago, and that can modernise the the technology to the the latest and greatest without having to buy a new vehicle, that's a pretty pretty awesome choice to have. Or if you know, I guess you've gone out and bought the second hand, um, you know, Tesla. Yeah, and it's you know it's that you're weighing it all up, and it's like well actually for X amount I can buy this older Tesla, but I can actually modernize it and have access to the latest and greatest. That I think is it very I cool. think it keeps the hardware relevant. You know, there's mm. always a little bit of a push and pull between hardware, firmware, and software, and we haven't really had the conversation when it comes to cars until Tesla made electric vehicles more mainstream. And it's nice because, it, you know, I travel a lot, you travel a lot. I notice this even in rental cars sometimes when the heads up display is very clearly dated and awkward and sometimes not even useful anymore, or it has outdated TomTom Tom tech or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. And it feels older than it is. I'm, I'm the guy when I get to SFO, I get to San Francisco airport, go to, you know, pick up my, my car. Cause I tend to like to sort of, you know, just have that freedom being able to, you know, of dr- course, drive of around the it's place. It's not the most publicly transportable um, city either. And then I'll be like <laughs> jumping in and out of cars. We, okay, which one's got, you know, CarPlay, Android Auto? Oh, that's got a smaller screen. Oh, this one's bigger and it's got all the, you know, it's, it's okay. Because some of them will have have that tech. Some of them won't. Be, yeah, they can be quite variable. Oh, yeah. Um, and even two cars that, that look identical, there might be a, you know, might be a variable. So yeah, um, yeah. Th- I mean, this is uh, this is good. 
And I think it's important as Elon and Tesla move out of the early adopter market as well, because that's originally who bought Teslas. Yeah. I mean, living in the Silicon Valley, it's the most popular car on the road from a spectator perspective. But the if you're going to really sustain, especially in a country as large as America, you need to reach every single consumer. And nobody wants to feel outdated after 18 months. I mean, I don't even want to feel outdated on my cell phone after 18 months, which mm. is why folks like you and I tend to upgrade. That's a little more impractical when you're talking about a forty-five thousand to eighty-five thousand dollar vehicle. And I think there, there's there are there are those like us who who want to be testing out the latest, you know, in tech. And you know, like for me, it was the first time I bought a new car, and really? so I've I not bought one either. I yeah. don't, you know, I don't really want if there's some new capabilities coming out next year. To be having to put that onto the second hand market and then buy myself, you know, an, another another Tesla, right? In terms of right. the economics, so the idea that yep, you might have to wait a little while. You're not going to be right at the front of the queue, uh, but that option of being able to mm-hmm. upgrade within a you know a reasonably timely period. Now, there's a there's a flip side to this, and this is that sort of I guess disruptive aspect of it. Uh, is this I think puts a good a good pressure on you know, the rest of the industry, and we're already seeing changes. Like it's Agreed. great to see uh, you know BMW have um, have the the dash to cam type capability uh, as a software update. So yeah, leveraging the capabilities in uh, you know in the in the vehicles uh, and being able to uh, yeah basically that dash cam you know cap- capability and so i'm i'm sure that that will just that will just increase because they've set they've set the bar um the downside with tesla you know controlling all of these things at the moment is that they don't have android auto and they don't have carplay because they've you know they've completely they've created their own customized ecosystem. and built their own yep and there are some things that are actually better with android auto or with carplay but in the scheme of it Hey, they're doing all right. Yeah, I, and you know, I think I, I'm rooting for them. I'm rooting for this type of model where your upgrade doesn't have to be buying a new car every four or five years, or getting away from a lease model, for example, which is very yeah. popular in the U.S. and yeah. not always the most sustainable. Mm-hmm. So, I th- I think this is great. I you know, I, I hope that folks see this as an opportunity to hold on to their vehicles for longer. It's better for the planet that way. Yeah, and. I, I think that the price point is actually quite friendly. If you can essentially be up to date for twenty five hundred bucks, that's a pretty good deal at the end of the day, mm-hmm. and and it saves you a lot of cash. So so I gotta ask, were you a Cybertruck fan? I was initially when I when I looked, I thought, oh, is this is this a joke? Uh, but as I, <laughs> as I took, it was just like it looked so foreign and freaky. But you know, actually, I've you know I've I've put, you know, I mean, it's so cheap to put a reservation down anyway. So I've put reservation down on the, on a, you know, on a couple of variants. Um, we we will see, we will see. But there are there are definitely some aspects to it that uh, uh, click for me, which I don't know whether I like myself for uh, for liking the Cybertruck. I sort of feel like I see I always your body like, language right now. You're a little I sheepish. Like to be agnostic about you know about brands but i there, there there's just something about where tesla are at the moment from that technology standpoint and just some of the things they're doing that i find it very hard to say oh well there's there's this company or that company that that feels to me on the yeah. same playing field not that other companies aren't better in other way in mm-hmm. other ways with their vehicles and yeah. so i totally understand why you know they're still a, a minor player uh, overall in the in the car market, but yeah, so that's that's where that's where I'm at, and I'm I'm very hopeful that uh, the market will change so that it, yeah. so that I could I could choose equally good offerings from you know a bunch of different brands that will click with my interest in sitting at the forefront of technology and you know a vehicle that's going to update itself and get better over time, and and Absolutely. I think we're, we're on that journey. But it's there's still a I think a quite a clear differential for Tesla at the moment. Absolutely, I, I, I'm glad that their continued success encourages competition towards a more sustainable automotive market. Yeah. Now, um, COVID nineteen coronavirus. This is just you know unstoppable at the moment. It seems, and it's it's kind of crazy when you you look at the stats, you look at the 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 impact on. Um, 
share markets, you look at how oh, man, you know, yeah. countries are getting closed closed down with you know Italy and it's you know all these things that have you know just been just been announced there. Uh, of course, looking at the the tech world, well, you know Seattle's been you know very heavily uh, impacted with now you know, a number of companies of you know the the big the big players with Amazon and Microsoft and uh, so on uh, now saying look just go and work from home um, mm-hmm. so probably nice if you if you you know working for somebody else and you have to deal with rush hour traffic in Seattle because it's going to be a, it's going to be a fair chunk better at the moment definitely um, Seattle's also taken some interesting steps so Full disclosure, I'm biased. I went to the University of Washington and, and started my first business in Seattle many years ago. We won't say how many. And I am very proud of UW. So they actually started creating their own tests. So the United States has had a very, very low supply of coronavirus tests. And my alma mater, way to go Huskies, Husky for life, they, they were creating their own right away when this started to happen. And so... While, while Seattle is, is kind of ground zero, there are now more cases in New York than there are in Washington State, but they do have the, the systems in place, I think, to actually be taking the right measures to hopefully contain what is rapidly becoming a borderline pandemic. And I'm, I'm curious to see how they handle this health crisis and, and hopefully in a very progressive manner moving forward. Yeah, one of the things that caught my attention last week was um, a mention of Alibaba's uh, AI yeah. system being able to t- detect uh, coronavirus in a matter of seconds with a, a reasonably high accuracy. Uh, that said, um, yeah, accuracy is, is an interesting thing. 96% was uh, mentioned in the, in the coverage I read. And, you know, first of all, I thought, well, you want it. You want it to be a hundred percent. You don't want a, a misdiagnosis, um, but actually, just having having an option where technology can can maybe do this in an alternate manner to how we've tested uh, traditionally could be very handy in some cases. Um, now, this particular this particular case, it was. Um, they use a CT scan. Yeah, they for had this, to do a CT scan, right? Which is pretty extensive in terms of, you know, I mean, we come from two very different healthcare environments. We so, do. as an American, the odds of getting a CT scan as a potentially preventative measure or as a precautionary measure are about zero. The, however, the thing that I do like is that, according to the article that we read, is it only takes 20 seconds, which is faster than the existing testing. So if someone mm-hmm. comes in, they're presenting with the respiratory systems that we know are associated with this, they can very quickly tell and hopefully get someone care because immunocompromised, it, it is pretty deadly and dangerous for them depending on their stage yeah and what this for me triggers is a thinking around how we will handle these things in future as we get more data points more Mm -hmm. information i can imagine x years from now you know i don't i don't know how yeah how far down the track it might be you know five or ten years where there would be enough data points on maybe not all of us but those who you know, choose to uh, expose their their data to an AI or what have you, right? You've got <laughs> to your wearable expose your data. It'll be like the next streaker, right? <laughs> You're like, <laughs> there are nudists and there are data <laughs> exposers. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, those who are willing to have a wearable and have the data sort of sink back somewhere, um, maybe cameras and other bits and pieces that can you know pick pick things up. You know, and we and we know some of these uh, you know 3D type cameras that can read your heart rate and mm-hmm. yeah, there's just, there's so much information that can be drawn that. We Ooh, yeah. could easily be in a point, you know, not not too far from now, and and probably the technology is actually there now. If you joined up all the data points to do a reasonably good job of, you know, I don't know, you know, if there's a temperature sensor and a few other bits and pieces, actually, if you you know, you line lined somebody up, they shared data off their wearable and a few other bits and pieces to actually, you know, make a reasonably you know accurate analysis and and decide but i definitely think that's that's the direction we're heading where this stuff actually becomes quite you know 
quite easy with with sufficient you know data being drawn off our off I our, do think we're our, starting you know, to, sensors, to watch that right? and I'm I don't know how popular biohacking is down here in New Zealand but in the valley people hack their bodies uh, about as much as they hack technology yeah, so I don't see I don't see so many it's not something where when you walk down you know say Coe Road or you know you walk around Christchurch or, or Wellington that uh, there are too many places where you know right next to the you know tattoo parlor there's you know a place where you can you know wander into and, and get something you know wired, wired into you or your RFID chip for your you know office or your Tesla or your you know whatever right. or, or your credit card sort of shoved under your skin but yeah <laughs> I know this stuff happens and it's it's kind of freaky um, and you know you no know, it is it is it's a little spooky and and there's pros and cons right so the the pro is we could save so many lives if we're monitoring ourselves more consistently mm. and a, and a mm. lot of people do not get the diagnosis in time and that really affects their longevity yeah on the flip side if you've had a naughty night out, your insurance company may get a little memo and you could see a rate increase because you drank too much yeah, yeah. or you know had a cheeky smoke. And I think that there's a huge, there's a really interesting ethical dilemma there. And, and for me personally, I don't think the tech and the data privacy is at a security level where I'm personally comfortable sharing my data. However, I could very much see a time in which and where it makes sense if I could optimize my human performance, which is something I think about a lot from a mental perspective, just yeah, less of a yeah. physical perspective. Yeah, yeah. It's dicey, though. So, yeah, in, interesting times. Um, and look, of course, if, if Alibaba can do this, then... Yeah, we know other players would would likely be able to achieve something. Something. I like similar. that it's so a big player here too. I think that's yeah. actually really important because I've, I'm sure you've seen this too. I've seen a lot of health technology that is very exciting, but the company is too small and they either can't scale fast enough or they mm. can't get bought fast enough and they run out of money. And I think with with Alibaba, full disclosure, I own a few shares of Alibaba. I think that there's a really good opportunity for for scale in solutions like mm. this. Mm. So mm. I'm I'm excited to see more work like this. I mean, so many different solutions being thrown into the media right now that could potentially help us with detection and prevention and treatment of coronavirus. So, I, you know, I'm keen for solutions always. And, and if this is one of the ways we go, maybe we bring down the cost of CT scanning as a technology overall. And there's another win in this for us. Yeah. 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 Uh, now, also related to this, maybe we'll delve into it actually a bit later is, the, is that situation that the Amazon and Microsoft staff and others are in in terms of the what that working from home you know, pictures looking like if we have uh, if we have time to uh, but uh, I guess also looking at data privacy joining up different sort of dots behind the scenes is the story that came through about Airbnb. Now, this is a spooky one. It is spooky, but in many ways it's probably it's probably if you if you sort of think about it, it's probably what you would expect to a degree to be going on, right? So For, Airbnb yes. are giving or are, you know within their <laughs> within their database giving they are assigning a um I guess a a, a risk rating um, or risk assessment and uh, some sort of personality uh, test against each person who rents with them. So they're really, you know, I guess joining up some dots and saying, you know, I'm not exactly sure. You know, I don't know quite. what I think what, it's essentially what, what an what algorithmic the, what the data looks assessment like. of your character, which is, you know, we all took those personality tests when we were younger, right? And, yeah, and yeah. unfortunately, certain people did as we got older, and that unfortunately informed the wrong parties about people's personal preferences and, and allowed for some election hacking and a bunch of other stuff. So I'm always a little skeptical on, on the personality testing front myself. What I what I think is a little eerie about this is, you know, I remember when the ride sharing companies uh, people uncovered that they were rating riders the same way that we were rating drivers. Right. And to a degree that was a bit shocking. 
And I think we were all kind of like, oh, whoa, didn't realize that was happening. But on the flip side, it was really easy to find out what that score is. You can you can check your ride sharing app right now, whatever your preferred platform is, and you can see what you're rated. And that, okay, so that's fine. There's transparency there, right? And and Have they done that now? It used to be you had to actually ask a driver I think, and I think ask you, them what your score was. Oh, no, you can, you can look, at, you least can, in the, yeah. at least in the U.S. On, on, okay. uh, I can't, I'm a I Lyft user myself, okay. and we'll get into the to yeah. the yeah. other <laughs> challenger to that story yeah. in a little yeah. bit here. Yeah. But I, I, I'm, I'm curious about that, and I unfortunately have sent a few friends who were a bit inebriated home on my accounts before, <laughs> that, and that has actually led to uh, a lower than perfect score on one of the platforms, still five Five stars on Lyft, thankfully, and that leads to coupons. So I, I don't mind incentivizing good behavior, both as a renter or as a rider. But I do think that the thing that spooked me about the article wasn't just that they were necessarily looking for safety and consistency, but there was a little bit more of that personality piece. And in terms of, so what does that mean exactly, right? So where are you pulling these data points from about my personality? And and for me, I, I mean, I feel lucky. I was joking with a friend coming into this today that my Airbnb requests always get accepted immediately. So whatever it is, I'm doing it right. Please let that be the case continuously, Airbnb. <laughs> I would not like to get blacklisted for this dialogue. But on the flip side, I, I, it's a, I don't like the idea of this black box assessment because what what happens? I mean, you and I both, you are an Airbnb host. I've been a host. Yeah, well, I like looking at both sides of these things, yeah. right? which is partly why I got into it. And I sort of got partway through doing the same for Uber because I was sort of was curious to see the other side. But then I, you know, I, I, I chickened out of um, of that, and I don't particularly want to be. Uh, driving uh, an Uber, but I, I would like to at some stage see the other side of it. So maybe I'll I'll sign up and 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 drive at some at some stage for a you know a once or twice. But <coughs> yeah, so looking looking at it from that other uh, that other side as somebody that rents out a property, you do subconsciously or otherwise, um, you know, you you do worry sometimes around what you learn about you know certain types of uh, guests are more likely to use and abuse your place and then give you a bad rating for it and there's there's that challenge now the, the particular article that um, we picked up was in um, zerohedge.com I'm not sure whether they were the uh, I'm not, no they weren't the original um, source of it but the yeah, there's that there's that aspect where well the the article is saying that Uber does this and it and it is Uber that's doing it and as somebody that's a host you don't you don't really see anything so the comment in the there was a comment in the article um, that said Airbnb does not want people who are shy anxious or depressed to rent their apartments condominiums or homes because those types of people are likely to leave negative comments. Now, to me, that just seems so ridiculous. I don't know where exactly where a comment like that comes from because right. as a host, I just get the inquiry. Right. And and I mean, basically as a host, you don't you know, you as long as, you know, the timing and everything else fits, either and and in fact in most cases uh, you have the system set up, you know, once you, once you get familiar with it, so that somebody makes a reservation, it's automatically accepted, right? right. They're, they're prob- I guess maybe where it comes in is there are some situations where it will it will fire it to me and let me choose. Now, I think we also think maybe probably- pre-qualified for instant booking as renters because I'm sure you're like you. I used I've used Airbnb probably 50 different times in 10 different countries. So, yep. and and you've been a good we, good guest, so well far. rated, right? So, <laughs> or so, so they it just, think <laughs> it just goes through. Yeah. Yeah, so I I mean I think our experience might be a little bit different, you know, when you're new to the platform. I think that may have some effect on it. The thing that irks me a little bit about the we don't want anxious or depressed people writing reviews well first of all you know the the increase in antidepressants in the united states is up 400 percent in the last 10 years so that could pretty much be all of us right on a given day uh and and in addition to that not just looking at a numbers game but that it, it becomes a falsely inflated platform to a degree it's almost the reverse effect of yelp so when when yelp was gaining in popularity they banned a bunch of people i have actually been legitimately banned multiple times from yelp just for writing 
like legit positive reviews. I wasn't even trying to game the system. I just happened to be a marketer who uses colorful language and they thought it was inauthentic. Uh, they pulled my mom as a, as a chiropractor and they pulled her entire company page because she got five five star reviews in a row and she thought and they thought she was gaming the system. So Yelp sort of did the inverse of this, which was if you're too positive, get out of here. And they sort of let the snark live. And Airbnb is kind of doing the opposite, which I find, I just find it a little bit fluffy. You know, I mean, you do need to have an authentic review. And one of the things that I like about Airbnb reviews is even, you know, depending, I, I don't even necessarily look at the star rating per se, obviously to a certain degree I do, but the nuance of it doesn't matter to me. But I would like to know, hey, the Wi-Fi was a little slow or whatever because I'm a business traveler mm -hmm. or and it doesn't mean that I might not stay there or that I I would rate that person less than five stars but there are certain things where you do want to know yeah. the truth Re reviews reviews are handy there, there yeah. is a, there is an aspect to reviews on a lot of these platforms that I think that people don't realize so as a as a right. host if you write a bad review about somebody they can actually the guest can request that that be pulled down and oh, so they yeah. could say actually you know um there's a few or there's a few bits and pieces like that i'm not exactly sure well no one of them is if somebody yeah i did come across that somebody somebody um saying that they they requested to have one pulled down um and there are some different ways to do that um as a host you can request to have um a review taken down but they don't care unless the guest says oh yeah you know I, I got it wrong I you know said this but I I was having know, a bad day yeah or, I took or, it out or, on that Airbnb or, review yeah, yeah, my sassiness was level 10 totally <laughs> and, get it and there are aspects totally get to it. it like with Airbnb if you're going to be a host you want to do a really good job and be a super host because right basically that's that's the way to make it that's how you stand out good a good business, lots of lots of bookings, and and so on. If you don't get into that category, then your profitability and your you know success with it from a you know making a, re a return uh, is dram is often dramatically lower. So you oh, know yeah. it creates all of these these pressures. And then um, I guess it, it can be a little bit like um, uh, let's say somebody asks for a reference when they when they leave your business. I mean. You'd never see the sort of written reference, you know, it says, oh, you know, Paul was a good employee, but, you know, he had these faults and, you know, this this and that, right? And it's pretty rare, i got to say, for Airbnb hosts to leave uh, to leave a bad review because there's, there's a little bit of, you know, pressure there and... Well, and there's and kind of that double opt-in with the reviews too. Yeah. You you know you get nudged if I write a review about your place, and vice yeah. versa. I get nudged if you said something nice about me. Granted, it's a double blind, so we can't see each yeah. other's until yeah. until publishing. But I know what you mean. I mean, I think you know at the end of the day, the idea is we authentically want to have a good experience, and we're grateful to share each other's spaces. Mm. There's always going to be people that are malicious in that. But one of the things that I that I thought was interesting was when, you know, there was that initial story, shoot, this was probably seven years ago, but there was the party thrown in an apartment in New York that got really illicit and out of control, and that's when Airbnb implemented their insurance policy. And for me, I don't know if you felt this way, but as a host, that made me feel really comfortable having guests in my house because there's a million-dollar insurance policy on that rental action. So It, I, it sounded good, but then what I heard from other hosts is, it's not worth the, it's it's very very hard to claim on. So it sounds. Oh, good. I claimed so a you... fifty dollar speaker and they replaced it right away. Okay, okay. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, my experience was really positive. Yeah. Somebody yeah. I think just spilled a glass of water on one of my little you know yeah. sound bars, oh, that's and good. I I took a picture of it, sent it in, and it's possible because it was you know it was probably eighty bucks or whatever. Well, it might not but... have been on the insurance. It might have got charged back also to oh, to have. the guest, right? Yeah, so, but they, it was immediate. I mean, yeah. Airbnb it, they That's credited great. my account yeah. right away, and I was able to replace it. And this, granted, this was kind of early in the beginning of the policy, so mm. it's possible they've been inundated a little bit. But I, I have to say, from my personal like, experience, I got to give them credit for that because yeah, and yeah, it, and absolutely. it gave me peace of mind. Yeah. yeah so yeah, and that is one of the challenging things is you can't automate all of these processes, right? And then we right. had hearing about the Uber situation where drivers were able to claim for 
damage done by a passenger and then these sort of faked photos apparently. You know, oh, yeah. So, so, so it came out. A lot out of fraud of, in Uber. Of, Fake rides, um, a whole bunch yeah, of stuff. Yeah, thing, thing, things going on that Yeah. Yeah, actually when – you know, Uber started, you know, apparently started, you know, Googling some of these photos of, you know, a, a driver saying this damage was done to my vehicle. And then, you know, Uber do a reverse image search on that and then find actually that image has been around on the Internet for, yeah. you know, X number of years and someone's just submitted it and, and mm-hmm. you know, potentially got a $200 payout or something. Right. So, um, I mean, yeah, if there's a way to f- to fraud or scam a system, someone will figure it someone out. Someone figures it out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's just inevitable. Um, now, t- uh, talking about uh, Uber, and I know you, you know a fair bit about this, um, and we've talked about before uh, – Anthony Lewandowski, who was in a pretty pivotal role in uh, you know Uber's and uh, in, in, in uh, Google or now Waymo's sort of self-drive uh, technology, uh, obviously a very smart uh, engineer based on you know some of the amounts of money that that he was paid that have come out. Casual 120 million for those not 120 aware. million dollar bonus that he got that he got paid. 120 million. <laughs> Can you imagine readers it's, what would you do or yeah. listeners what would you do with 120 million? My gosh. It's kind of hard to get your head around especially here in New Zealand where you know we I don't think we've you know ever had you know, even a CEO who's who's had a you know say you know 10 million dollar you know annual annual pay you and then you compare it to uh Lewandowski yeah 120 million US so what's it, you know probably 180 million uh New Zealand uh, dollars in uh, that, a bonus. As, as a bonus right on top an of, annual bonus you know whatever <clears throat> whatever else he uh, he he received um so we we heard about the drivers he moved across to Uber oh, after setting up his own uh firm that got acquired by Uber um you know there were but he was accused of, of stealing um, 14,000 documents from Google containing their information. Uh, well, so to be clear, he downloaded every single piece of LiDAR documentation he had created at Waymo to his personal computer hours before walking away to go found Auto. And we've talked about this stuff so happening in, in New Zealand. We've talked about that in the last, I don't know, six months or so. Now, what's a little bit different here in this case is what the penalty was on him compared to in New Zealand where we heard about a little bit of this happening and, yes, there's reputational damage and so on. So what happened here is the courts have said he must pay Google $179 million. So... Uh, yeah, well, well north of a quarter of a billion dollars, uh, New, Z- New Zealand dollars. So, um, yeah, there's some lessons in that, aren't there? About you know, oh, don't yeah. be a dick, don't don't nick people's intellectual property, even if you know you were creating it while you're at that firm. Um, but the numbers just well, in the whole know, succession, he really he wasn't discreet about it at all. So he downloads all the files. He starts this company called Auto, a, a trucking uh, autonomous vehicle company that Uber then buys six months later, which is absolutely insane if you think about the speed. I mean, it would take most companies a, a significant amount of time to catch up in in this particular space, especially given the amount yeah. of IP around it and to navigate that. And so. For so they already went to court back in uh, May 2017 was when the courts pulled uh, Lewandowski off of Auto's lidar program. Uber actually agreed as a result of not having to pay massive fines. They they basically shut down this part of their autonomous program. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in a bunch of different directions that has literally been wasted, that will go nowhere, that could have been extremely powerful in a lot of other industries, and and is kind of tied up in, in just a few people. And, and, and to boot, as soon as he gets you know uh, assessed with this fine, he files for bankruptcy and says that he can't pay it. <laughs> and in the United States, that pretty much means he won't have to pay it. But he will also be bankrupt. In theory. 
in theory. Bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on how that, yeah, where, where, where that money's uh, hidden away. He's only, you know, he's only, uh, what, 40 years old-ish, so there's plenty of still prime working years for him. And I don't know. I would clearly say his, a very na- savvy his, chap. Na- his name would be somewhat mud, but uh, still su- somebody will you know, no doubt hope, but pay, man, do the brilliant something. jerks continue yeah. to get employed yeah. <laughs> throughout all their, all their time. If you're curious about this uh, story, listeners, I was just telling Paul as we were starting up the cast, Mike Isaac recently wrote a book called Super Pumped. It came out in September. It is absolutely fantastic. If if you're up for the Uber drama, the LiDAR drama, there, there are so many layers of this drama. If you really want to see the dark side of venture capital and, and very narcissistic leadership, can't recommend it enough. Good recommendation. Now, on to... Uh Going back to sort of you know tracking and and the like uh, was a story of a man who happened to be riding his bike one day, as as you do, uh, reasonably near to his home. This was in uh, um, Florida, and uh, he, I guess, had. Um, Either an, uh, he had an Android phone linked back to his Google account, Gmail, YouTube. Well, whatever, so his whole thing was he, he was he's using a fitness app to track his cycling, which we all do. I mean, I use Strava today to on a run up to the top of Mount Eden. Yep. And he the the geofencing around this particular woman's home, who poor ninety seven year old woman has has some jewelry stolen. That's a shame. Dude just happens to live in the neighborhood and be cruising around, minding his business, and he becomes subject, uh, you know, criminal suspect number one because he happened to have passed by her house three times while on his bicycle. Which, you know, if you're running errands, that's out and back, and then maybe out to your buddies again. It's not, it's not a big deal. He had no idea. And the only way, the thing that was really eerie about this, and I've had some interesting interactions with the government. It's maybe for another podcast, but he, he had no idea why the why he was being called in for this no one told him hey you rode your bike past this house he had to look up the case number discover where this woman lived he and then did quite th- a bit of research yeah because he? he was given all he he was able to find out was a was a case number and then he had to go away and sort of dig and do research and oh yeah he he basically came back and said well look he you know he pushed back on this request uh, for the government to hand o- or for the government or for police to get all of his data off Google. And yeah, I mean I can I, look, I'm looking at this from both both perspectives. The, the data you know exists. If you were working in law enforcement and you know that there's all these bits and pieces of data and that could allow you to solve a case that otherwise might have zero chance of getting solved, then you would be very interested in how do you do that. And when we when we yeah. look back in years gone by, uh, you know, police have, in a, in a less sort of electronic um, basis, they've been able to do certain things like uh, get copies of text messages. I guess it's electronic too. Um, you know, listen in on phone calls sort of, back in the analog days and 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 you know still uh today to a degree so there's been some of those sorts of uh you know things that are possible now a lot of that is disappearing because of encryption and messages are are done in such a way that law enforcement can no longer see them but for things that are going through uh a a a firm like google etc and it's you know it's obviously not not just google uh then you know, there still has been this this ability for law enforcement to to want to you know draw in, but the, the thing here is they're really spreading a very broad net, right? Like they weren't saying, "Hey, we've got some security footage," uh, right? And <laughs> we saw that home you know we, we that saw caught the, him this creeping chat. up on the yeah uh, on the driveway. And <coughs> excuse me, the thing that I. The thing that irked me a lot about this is so I actually think there's a lot of cool stuff that can come from geofencing. You could get a trigger that, you know, this is your favorite restaurant when I happen to walk by it. I wouldn't mind if my phone told me that. We're friends. I'd love to know where you like to eat in Auckland. You know, that's, yeah. that's great. That's kind of fun information if yeah, you opted yeah. into that data sharing. Yeah. The thing that spooks me out here is, I mean, 
he obviously clearly allowed Google to have access to his information through that app, through his settings. So yeah. location sharing is something that I turn off with, with pretty much everything that I use. I know a lot of us in this space do just not only to save battery, but to save sanity and to, to you know, sort of preserve our privacy. But the thing that's that's like particularly spooky about this is he he was never told that this was happening, and there wasn't the traditional sort of uh, you know interrogation. He wasn't innocent until proven guilty. He was guilty by a geographic association, which is insanity to me. Right there, there can be hundreds, if not thousands, of people that walk by a certain home on a given day, and just because homie happens to be you know tracking his exercise, he's somehow a criminal. And it's not like his legal team is going to get their money back. I mean, in the article, they mentioned his parents have to dip into their savings to pay for a lawyer to even really figure out what's going on here, let alone provide a defense. And so here we've got private citizens having to spend unnecessary hard-earned dollars to defend against, you know, algorithms and and geofences. And it, it becomes a little, uh, makes me yeah, a little and, uncomfortable. And this is a case of a, a $2,000 burglary. And I know... Yeah, here in New Zealand, if you call police about a burglary, you know, good luck to the police, you know, whether they'll even even turn up in, you know, in some cases. Uh, so I'm sure there are a few people that have been impacted by this sort of thing and would think, well, if the police could get it, I would be all for it. But, you know, we've, we do have to look at it from all perspectives. And what sort, you know, if this if things continue down this sort of track and we see elements of this in certain uh, parts of the world today where governments and police uh, don't have any boundaries around the data that they can collect uh, you know we we can see a point that is really really worrying so look, yeah this this, <coughs> well, this, and- this does it does concern me although I think they're there's still more work to do around, you know, working out how you how you draw a fence around data and you know what is fair and appropriate. Look, if this was a case of you know a brutal murder or something else, you know, where do you draw the line? Say, so, well, at that level, we will allow you know police access to a little bit more data, but it can't be obviously an assumption of guilt it's just hey this becomes your net of data just like they might look through some security camera footage and other bits and pieces like oh okay uh you know this in this case the um the chap mr mccoy you know he might be one of a you know, hundred people that have been in an area um if that's treated appropriately but I, it is. Yeah. Well, I, well I, so I think something that's also really interesting here is is the way that the big companies deal with this. So Google very clearly readily provided this information to authorities. Apple takes a very firm stance the other direction. Apple consistently and repeatedly refuses to hand over information to the FBI or to local authorities because they fundamentally believe in allowing in in the rights of the individual. They won't yeah. unlock phones. They refuse to do that. It's actually one of the reasons. I mean, not that I don't think there's a certain level of privacy compromising anytime you're using a device on the internet, but it's one of the reasons that I've been an Apple loyalist from my phone and from you know we're both sitting here with Macs. It it, it matters to me. That they're not just gonna oh oh that's interesting here we'll just serve up all the data we have on Savannah and you can come to any conclusion you want yeah, about yeah. her behavior. Well, I think in this case it is worth pointing out that the way that um, his name Zachary McCoy, the way that he found out was actually an alert from Google, and they were writing to let him know that police had demanded this information, so they had jumped through, you know, in theory, the the relevant um, you know legal steps to request the data and Google was saying we will release this now this is the hard bit Google was saying we will release this data um, unless he went to court and tried to block it and he had just seven seven days so he had to move very very quickly to, to push most people can't afford know, to do pu- that push back on this yeah this circumstance, which is right? insanity yeah so it's not as though Google would just they just jumped in and handed it out immediately but and what we are right, seeing, they were right? asked I mean, for it. Apple, yeah. Apple have really, you know, they've played that, uh, or they've, they've taken that focus on um, 
um, you know, data privacy. And we have seen pushbacks from you know, Apple, Microsoft, you know, and I think Google have been a part of this too, where we've seen them, you know, push back on on certain things. But in other cases, where you know the 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 legal points are very clear, where um, you know they have complied, but we are seeing, a, I think, quite a, you know a fair chunk of of pushback from uh, you know the big the big tech players around just handing over what's um, you know what's what's being demanded. But I can see this being being a case where yeah maybe Google could have could have handled a little bit different uh, and. You know, I guess it's this getting the sort of coverage that it that it's got. Yeah, it, it all helps, right? It puts that pressure back on them to to think through. Well, is this really appropriate? These sort of big spread the net really wide, uh, you know, scenarios. And is a of, random of daytime data. burglary of nominal value? No offense to this woman. Really, yeah. the instance in which yeah. we want to breach privacy in this regard. You know, it's a nonviolent crime. Yep. Yeah. I don't know. Mm. Um, now on to uh, on to s- something uh, local. Uh, Spark have uh, announced that um, they uh, have now Spark have had their um, their their five G uh, lab going in in Auckland City, and I went through that um, when they when they first sort of opened it. Um, Oh, some time now. You know, I think um, maybe first first uh, half of of um, uh, 2019. They've had a lot of people sort of in and in and out of there. Um, but now they're um, they're announcing sort of uh, stepping things up, I suppose, with their uh, 5G starter uh, fund, and so they're putting a little bit of uh, money on the table, and uh, you know, encouraging people to. Uh, uh, to get in touch, and uh, you know they're going to invest uh, a little bit uh, into uh, into some uh, startups or, or entities that are doing um, doing some smart stuff or want to do some smart stuff uh, around five G. So um, yeah, nice nice to have uh, have that go- going on. It is exciting. <clears throat> um, I think it you know with with something um, like five G. It's kind of interesting because we've we've had very fast internet, uh, you know, for some time. Five uh, G is is um, you know it's it's the next iteration of, of mobile can- connectivity, but not everybody everywhere is going to be able to uh, get it immediately. And as with any new technology, it can take some time to sort of figure out you know what is it that's really going to benefit from from this new uh, you know, new connectivity um, or new new technology. And so um, I like that um, that spark. And I know Vo- you know Vodafone have have, have been do- you know they've been doing their own um, things in terms of working with with startups and and um, and innovators as well. Um, but by Creating this uh, this starter fund, it it allows uh, you know companies to to you know jump in boots and all and, and hopefully you know invent the next uh, thing that will will take advantage of the new technology, right? This is something that I think is actually really cool about New Zealand in general is there are a lot more funds and whether mm-hmm. they be from great companies like Spark or from the government, you facilitate the adoption and action by early stage companies in these new technologies in a way that in the United States it's only done through angel investing and venture capital. Mm -hmm. So you Mm -hmm. must have a pitch and a solid business plan whereas I think in this case my impression and correct me if I'm wrong if you have a great idea this could be and and the ability to implement that idea Mm -hmm. this is Mm -hmm. potentially a program for you yeah which I think is quite lovely yeah yeah I did see a weird sign I want to ask you about I, in Victoria Park yesterday where the, it, there was a 5G protest. Oh, yeah, they're pretty common around New Zealand. It's, so we don't know, really have this going on in the States. Can you tell me what's up with that? Well, we have this thing in, in New Zealand where um, there is, there's a segment of the population, and I, you know, I hope I'm not offending any of our, um, any of our listeners, um, but there's a segment of our, our population um, that believe that uh, vaccines are 
a really bad thing, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they really push back on this idea of, of having children vaccinated, whether right. it's against the measles and, you know, what have you. And, you know, we've seen what the impact of that is in recent times. You personally were... I was literally were, uh, quarantined for 18 days <laughs> yeah. because of folks with measles on my flight recently. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I think probably the very large percentage of the majority understand what the benefit of, of these... You know the option of being vaccinated, or the the you know necessity for youngsters to be vaccinated, uh, um, you know for for various things, and you know we've we've seen um, you know life inspect- expectancies and and you know so many things improved over the last you know hundred years from a health perspective because of vaccines. Yet there's this segment of the the population that just think you know this is terrible and you should not vaccinate your children and, and mm-hmm. so on. And right now we're in this uh, you know, position with COVID-19 where you know, so many people around the world are desperately trying to come up with a vaccine that would keep us safe from, from COVID-19 as there is right. a, a flu vac- vaccination, right? Um, now, strangely, when it comes to 5G, um, it's often, often... And I'm sure it's not the case. It might not be, you know, always the case. But there seems to be this tie. And if I look at my my own Facebook, and I've got a uh, particular old friend from um, from intermediate school in Christchurch, from uh, Kirkwood Intermediate, um, who um, I hope he's not listening. But if he is, then uh, that's fine too. Um, We're all entitled to and, our opinions. Uh, it's totally cool. And so you know, he he posts about that stuff, but he also posts about 5G. So when 5G was uh, announced that Vodafone were launching it in Christchurch in December and what the areas were. You know, he put something up there saying, hey, I'm going to be avoiding these areas of Christchurch and here's where you should stay away from because it's it's all scary. Um, yet the science just you know does doesn't really you know connect with with, with what I would say would be you know <coughs> madness in terms of concerns around 5G but there is that that group and the electromagnetic fields and all of this I'm doing a little recon yeah, as we're talking yeah. it looks like there have been a few events in the United States as well I, I'm I, sure there are around, around yeah the I world, mean there's in, in pockets there are always there are always the uh, you know folks who have differing opinions about any new technology and and we know that for sure so i mean it is a strong frequency that 5g uses it is a radio frequency that's different so for folks who are in some cases the 5g we have in new zealand at the moment is is really using the same sort of spectrum that we've used for 4g Mm -hmm. uh you know from a perspective of what's different well we get better performance but from a perspective of you know, other than that, it's it's basic. You know, it's four G with you know with another name in, in most regards. And oh, so, yeah. you know what what we what we you know what science uh, tells us about this stuff. Um, you know, is that yes, there are, you know there are there are uh, things that can be unhealthy with. Um, um, you know, if you're you're dealing with um, you know. Um, you know, certain types of things, if you stand in front of a big microwave dish and, and so on, or, you know, you were to climb inside a big microwave oven, yeah, that might not be too good for you. Um, but, you know, that that's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with, um, you know, non-ionizing radiation. Right. And, you know, all and of the things And it seems to be all speculative at this point, that, that, right? That, that, that this, is, this is fine. Well, it's interesting because they, the, the, the sort of folks, when I've been, you know seen stuff shared on Facebook, if you, you delve in and you, okay, well, let's click into this because they've got somebody who's making these claims those people aren't generally scientists. It might be like, oh yeah, this guy's a, you know, a general practitioner or you know whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. But this is not their area, really their area of expertise. And you click through on the articles, and it's just it's very weak. It's not you know there's not real genuine science behind any of it from you know anything that I've seen. And yeah, it just it just seems like absolute madness. You know, so there you go, um, and and cool. you know, I th- I think that most others involved in this this area, um, you know, w- w- would be just so relaxed about five G being around them, their families, and so on. Like, 
look, it wouldn't matter if you work for a telco or a firm that's involved. Um, you would not be standing up and and supporting this technology if it was going to cause harm to you or your family, right? I mean, they couldn't pay you enough money to do that. And there there is no science that's saying 5G is, is dangerous to our health. So, um, you know, let's just get over it. But, yeah, unfortunately there will be a few that will you know wave the flag there's always there's so always the the analog tribe that tries to keep things the way they are and i respect them for it to a certain degree and and also hope that we can continue to create greater tech for good that makes the whole world faster and more connected because yeah. i think in many cases yeah. it's wonderful for yeah. us um now we did we did talk you know about um these firms like Amazon and Microsoft, uh, where coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, has impacted some staff, so they've basically shut down you know, hundreds of thousands of people that are uh, no longer going in their office to, to work in the traditional manner. Uh, it's I guess it's the great work from home uh, experiment started off in you know in China, of course, um, you know last month. And I've been been talking to uh, my clients at Gorilla around, well, how do they prepare? What you know, what should they do? Even you know, internally, we're talking around, well, what would happen if we needed to close down the office? What would that look like? And you know, we recognise, hey, we've got one member of the team that doesn't have a laptop, so it's okay. Organise a laptop. Right. Um, you know, what are the <clears> other safe. things yeah. we can do? Well, I know for me personally that. Uh, and and I don't know whether it's my eyesight, my age, maybe I'm lazy, um, but if I want to work from home and really be productive, I'm much better if I've got a setup that's pretty close to what I've got in the office, right? I want a decent size screen, I want you know a keyboard and a mouse, and I just you know I just want to be comfortable in that environment, have the right tools to work on yeah um and look i need a reasonable internet connection just to be productive let alone you know how it how it makes me feel but you know just right. to be actually get the job done i want i want that near identical sort of setup um so there's all these things to to consider and so what i've been recommending uh is that organizations should be looking if they're if they're in a sort of scenario where staff can work from home and you know it will vary if you run a you know a bakery and it's all hands-on or uh, it's a TV studio and you need people to be there in person and so on and and there's no you know no workarounds I, you know I don't think you can have uh, probably a bakery where you get everyone to go and bake from home right it's probably not going to work in most cases um, but if you're in a situation <laughs> it where it would be a very creative situation <laughs> yeah <coughs> uh, where where it's where it's possible to do so um, yeah and and look yeah it will vary from you know, situation to situation as to what's possible but I think we should all be preparing for what we you know what we've seen happen in other parts of the world absolutely and if that happens to New Zealand of course we don't want to see any more uh, you know infections here in New Zealand but if things do you know can continue as we've seen in other places we want to have the you know the minimum impact on you know people's health on their livelihoods we don't want to see companies you know hitting the wall and and so on so you know how can we minimize that minimize the impact well hey you know send all your staff home for a day set a date and say hey let's work from home let's let's see what it looks like for all the meetings that we would normally have and maybe you have a you know big team meetings the whole staff what have you in person meetings what would that look like if you did that over uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, you know, et cetera? What works, what doesn't? What are the things that at the end of that, that day or, you know, how, however long you, you, you do that trial for, what are the take-homes? So you right. can get it improved. So if, if you are in a position where you need to go and do that, and, you know, this is what we've seen, you know, Microsoft and Amazon, I think in both cases in Seattle, it's three weeks at home boom you know yeah things that things are shut down uh and so imagine three weeks of nobody in the office how well that would work what can you tweak and adjust before 
you know that hap- that happens if you know if it does happen um, i think i think one of the best steps that companies can take is documentation so when you've got remote workers i i've ran my company savvy millennial all remote <clears throat> since we started 20 or excuse me with our 22 employees for the last 4 years we we cover everywhere from the UK to Singapore. So we're literally, we're on a 24 hour clock. There's no way to schedule meetings with the team all the time. And quite frankly, we wouldn't want to. So for us, <clears throat> we're, we're in a unique position where it's very easy to adjust to this sort of thing. But I actually, shameless plug, so I was supposed to go to South by Southwest, the conference in Austin, it's been canceled. And the interview I was set to give there was with the CEO of GitLab. For those of you not familiar, the code repository, it is a 1200 person team, all remote. They were remote first. So pretty, pretty spectacular. They, they didn't necessarily try to do that out the gate. They let the culture of the team build and they saw that people were optimized remote. So they built a culture around that and they actually have a ton of resources. So if you're if you're sitting here and you don't know where to go or what to read next, go check out GitLab's. Uh, they have a, a whole set of information about remote work and steps for how you document so that when someone either gets back to their laptop or, I mean, you know, even if you're on the same time zone, you need to be working in the same documents at the same time so you're not yeah. in silos. Yeah. You need to be having that cross collaboration. You know, I was out having a glass of wine at the end of last week and made sure to buy some shares of Zoom for this particular reason. You know, yeah, we're going to yeah, see yeah. these tools yeah. start to to amp up and so i and think sh- sure enough i think they've they've gone up in the, in the <laughs> it's in about the, the only thing in my portfolio days. that isn't yeah. just taking a bath i'll, I'll be yeah. completely transparent with you that yeah, and actually yeah. some streaming uh deep tech that i uh, have a few shares in and a couple other things but i think that there's a this is a conversation that should be happening in general as we look to cut overhead and expand our global workforce and and it's it's about it, remote work only doesn't work. I mean, physical product to point baking, great example. It, it it breaks down when there's a communication breakdown and when there's a process breakdown. But if you're communicating smoothly and everyone understands the processes and the things that need to get done, I, I mean, I honestly think my team is more successful because we're remote than if I forced them to come into an office and they had the stress of a commute and they were away from their families. Might not work for everybody, and uh, you totally. know, it's, it's, it's not it's, for everyone. There's, you know, That's there's one definitely of the big some things. interesting discussions yeah. a, a, around that. And if you're remote only, are there certain you know skills and types of people? You know, do you totally. actually lack some diversity because you, well, you've got to work in this environment, and some people. They, you know, they love the being around people type element. You're one of those people, but you make right. it work because that's that's part and parcel of what you build into your day. Um, you know, you're you're far from you know. Remote. Oh, I'm around you're people all the time. To, I'm right, more just of, I'm more of, of a digital team. nomad in that yeah. regard with my business than yeah. actually quote unquote remote. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. When I and and actually, uh, Sid, the CEO of GitLab, and I are still doing our interview. If anyone would like to tune in, we'll be live streaming that and and giving our South by Southwest talk virtually. Since oh, that's so when is that happening? Union. How would people? Um, so jump well, on? I will be uh, tweeting. I'm at Savvy Savvy, and it'll be all over my Facebook, Savannah Peterson, my LinkedIn. We'll throw it up on the Savvy Millennial website. SavvyMillennial.com, and it's going to be coming out of GitLab's Zoom platform initially. So if you're following GitLab, G-I-T-L-A-B, we will be uh, doing this. If you want to share your coffee and have breakfast with us on Saturday morning, given the time change, uh, we'll be going live at 5 a.m. So it's going to be uh, lovely. I can't wait for the seven flat whites I'm going to have to have before that. And I'm not sure where I'm going to have them from because it's going to be so early in the morning. But there will definitely be a, a replay. And we hope that this interview is a resource for folks facing this exact dilemma. And yeah. and we're certainly not going to paint the picture that it's for everyone. A lot of the questions that we talk about is who isn't it for? How has that affected their culture? And, and what can folks learn from that that's actionable today? Because it is a very interesting dynamic that we're in. You do see teams that have never had even a remote day of the week or or a flexible work from home policy. They're actually struggling a bit right now, even even more so than the general economic crunch that everyone's feeling. So it's good to at least have a strategy, even if it's not your style, because this sort of thing, who knows? We don't know. We don't we, we don't know what's going to happen next. Yeah. So it's pretty zesty. Now. As we wrap up, or before we before we wrap up, I know we're um, you know we've had a had a had a good uh, a good run today. Um, As we always do, Paul. It's why I love coming. Now, maybe you could just fill people in on the packathons and events that yes. you've been involved in in New Zealand uh, recently. What 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 does that look like? I am so glad you asked. So. 
For those of you who may not be aware, since we're not always the best at bragging about the work that we do down here in New Zealand in general, there's a group called T3W that has partnered with Datacom, with uh, NZTE, and various regional government organizations over the last 18 months to do national Maori hackathons. Now, when I say this, I need you to understand how important this is and how different and unique this is to New Zealand, because when you have the government and the largest technology company in the country collaborating to empower native populations and, and all Maori, uh, they're all Maori owned businesses that we hack on in, in Gisborne. We've done two in Gisborne and in Tarafati and we just did one in Napier a week and a half ago. And if you're keen and you're listening to this right now, we're kicking one off in Auckland, the first one in Auckland on March 27th. You can register. It's free. You don't have to be a technical. Bring your brain. Uh, I can tell you it's the most important work that I do every single year and, and the amount that I have learned from working with Maori communities is in, incredible. I am, I am consistently humbled and honored by the process. But so to give you scope, this would be like the United States federal government partnering with Google and Facebook to empower Native Americans. Now, when I say that out loud, it's almost hard for me to do that without laughing because it's something that my country would never do. And, and maybe, maybe uh, prove me wrong, Americans, I would love to, I would love to see this happen in, in our country. But the fact that New Zealand understands, and, and these organizations in particular, and, and all of us involved, understand that what's good for Maori is good for New Zealand and it's good for the world. Absolutely. Is incredibly powerful. Mm. And, and it's just, it's beautiful work. And it's not just that it feels good, and it's not just that we all get a lot out of this and we like seeing small business grow. It's actually brought 10 million in GDP to Tarafati alone, and 35 jobs, two different different companies have scaled up. Striker Translations, for example, brought a team to Gisborne to build out from there. I mean, we're seeing the regional impact that we hypothesized we would see when we started building and fostering these communities. And quite frankly, I, I just cannot wait to see where this program sits in five years, 20 hacks from now, yeah. and, and what that not only means for these regional economies, for the country, but the examples that this will set for the world. It's just, it's special. It's beautiful. So where do people go to find out? So uh, you can go to, well, so you can check out our last one. It was the Hackathon is actually what it was called. So hackathon.co.nz. And then our latest is uh, Tamaki. Tamaki? How do I say that here? Tamaki. Tamaki. So hack Tamaki. AKL.co.nz is is cool. going to be this next one. You can also just Google hack Tamaki AKL and you should be able to find that. Stalk me on the internet and or Carrie Top on LinkedIn because he's posted about it 74 times. And you can I really encourage you to sign up. I promise it will change the way you think about how business can be scaled and grown. And uh, you know, I'm three for three, so you might get to see me cry. They're, they're so powerful, I always end up getting emotional recapping some part of the, the whole experience. Maybe because we don't sleep and there's a little bit of drinking at night. But <laughs> generally speaking, it's, it's, it's truly a, a, such a unique story of empowerment. And I'm so proud of everyone who participates and the businesses who are brave enough to allow all of us to, to hack on them. And, and thank you to T3W, to, to Datacom, and, and frankly to my sponsor here in New Zealand for facilitating my involvement here. I am the lone American at these and I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. That's awesome. That's great. Well, thanks for the update. Great to have you uh, back on New Zealand Tech Podcast. Such again, a pleasure, Paul. As always. Anytime. I love our chats. I love your perspective. Your your agenda and lineup is always such a treat. And we really covered we covered a range today, my friend. This was not a casual one. We got all over the map. Yes. It was and, awesome. Um, I like it. It's gritty. Yeah. No, there's there was some good some good some good topics and Look, the next few weeks ahead, the next few months, it's, there's there's it's really sort world. of so much unknown around what's going on. But you know, we will keep talking about these things and unpacking them. And look, anyone that has any suggestions or uh, areas that you you think that we need to delve into, definitely uh, you know do get in touch. Um, you know, always always love uh, hearing from um, our audience because. Hey, we're we're here to serve you and to uh, uh, provide content that's that's useful um, for New Zealand. So, hopefully, we've done that uh, again today. 
Now, just a reminder, we are now uh, on LinkedIn, so feel free to um, follow there on LinkedIn. And the other new uh, place where we are is YouTube, NZ Tech Podcast. Uh, so those are those are the two sort of newest places to to find the show. Uh, and there, there's still new development and other things that are sort of going on behind the scenes uh, and and really you know that and the continued investment back into our studio uh, is thanks to the companies that have that have partnered with us to support the show uh, who once again are Sumo Logic, Vodafone New Zealand, uh, Spark, Vocus, HP and Samsung. All right thanks everyone we'll catch you again Thank you next so week much. on the next episode. Thanks Savannah.